Arlen is over in London uh, for a couple of days, um, yeah. but based most of the time in the US. Um, and so we're, we're super lucky that she has found time to, to pop in and, and talk to us. Um, I will let Arlen introduce herself in a sec, but uh, I have a little spiel prepared and we'll see how accurate it is. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm watching you. <laughs> um, so, so Arlen, as I think most of you know, uh, runs Backstage Capital, which she set up three-ish years ago. Less than, right? yeah, officially three. less than. Officially less than three years ago, um, having worked previously in the music industry um, and originally raised a $5 million fund and invested in about 80 companies, is that about right? Give or take but on Give both sides, take. yeah. Cool. Um, and, and very excitingly, recently announced a $36 million fund, uh, which we, I'm sure, will get into. Um, uh, and we'll be investing in about 36 different... No, actually. Yeah. Oh, we, it's, I mean, it's we changed. Can talk about that. Okay, cool. No, we'll get into that. Hasn't changed, but okay. we can talk about it. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Arlen is, is currently sort of looking at various options to, to possibly expand her reach uh, into Europe and, and maybe London, um, yeah. which I'm sure we'll also get into. So... Um, yeah. I'm so, also so really jet lagged. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's halfway <clears throat> dreaming and halfway awake. <laughs> cool. But yeah, do you want to do you want to maybe uh, introduce yourself and, and cover anything that I might yeah, have missed? Yeah, you covered it. A um, cool. couple. Yeah, that's that's it's like a like a fake one, like a fake <laughs> glass, a magic glass. Um, yeah. So I I grew up in Dallas and and live in Los Angeles. Started the fund out of Texas and uh, have been in LA since we got going. Um, had a lot of ups and downs along the way, and we can certainly talk about that, and uh, I'll welcome your questions, and you can ask me anything. Um, I don't have to answer, but you can definitely <laughs> ask me anything, and I'm very open, and open book, as some of you may know. And yeah, we, so we've raised, the, the, you know, the details of that is that we've raised over three different funds, a total of a little over four million, because it did take, it was so difficult to raise. So we took over three calendar years and each year we had a different fund. Um, and we're actually getting uh, very, very, very close to 100 companies. And Which we'll be making an announcement about that next week. Nice, and that, yeah. that was your 2020 goal, right? It so was. Arlen likes to do things where she's two, two years ahead of schedule. <laughs> um. Yeah, it worked. I mean, when, when I was saying it was going to be 2020, uh, so that was, I was saying it to people five years, you know, away from that deadline, and they just thought I was out of my mind. They thought it was just. I don't even. I don't. I don't even know if they thought it was sane. Like they just yeah. thought it was just certainly not probable, you know, or possible. But it wasn't. It was also like just wishful thinking you know and so yeah about a year and a half early on that that thought amazing cool um so should we should we start kind of I guess back at the beginning before you got into venture um, what, what was it you were doing before that I did a lot of things um, none of them made money <laughs> but I, um, I I published a music magazine that turned into a um, lesbian magazine which the magazine itself was not gay, um, although <laughs> I would have loved it no matter what. <laughs> uh, but it was for women who like women and allies, basically, and um, set out to build a, a magazine that I could read and my brother, who is a uh, rapper in Texas uh, with tattoos on his neck, could read and both of us could enjoy it. And I, I, we did it. We did it. We created that. Um, actually just talked about or just had the, the magazine brought up in the Gimlet episode of, of, a, of the podcast series that we're part of. So if you go to gimletmedia.com and look up the startup podcast, um, I'm the subject of the season, which is like six episodes. We're four episodes in. One just debuted a few hours ago. I listened to it, uh, the crack of dawn. Um, that wasn't a good idea. I should have waited until I wasn't so sleepy. And um, then I, then that didn't work out. Like we worked as long as it worked, and then it didn't work out. And I learned a lot of good but difficult lessons. And then I did every, I did all sorts of temp work, data entry. I can type super fast, <laughs> and my mom's super proud of that uh, <laughs> to this day. Um, and and then I worked, I, I worked my way up in behind the scenes in music and the production side of touring which was a, 
wor when you work your way up to that, you're working with really awesome artists and on great tours, but you're also still doing a lot of work. Like I was doing a lot of work mm. even then. And that is when, um, when I got to a cool place there, I was very happy and wanted more of that type of work. I, I hustled for work all the time, but I also was learning, you know, a few years ago, learning about startups and it just called to me. And what, what was it that kind of led you down that path? What, what was it that made you think, actually, I want to get, get into startups and I'm yeah, from, from music? Um, it was a process. It wasn't just overnight. And it was a combination of seeing people that I admired in their, in their business um, acumen, um, like Ellen. I, thought, I think she still do. She, I think she is, makes really interesting business decisions. Ellen DeGeneres, I don't know if she's popular here. Um, Reasonably. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, like, I guess like nobody knows Oprah here. I don't understand that. <laughs> How do you not know Oprah? Like, Oprah's like, the most famous person in America, other than Obama. Anyway, so Ellen, uh, did someone have to explain who Oprah was? Oh, that would have been awesome. Okay. Um, uh, so, but Ellen was investing because so she's this entertainer who was investing in startups. So that was like, why is she investing in startups? You know, I gotta be, I'm gotta check that out. And then Ashton Kutcher was doing the same thing, and he was just the dude, where's my car guy? You know, he was just the '70s Kelso guy, '70s show, and he was investing his own money, like his own money, into the just like Ellen was. So I just thought, I gotta check out what this means. What is a startup? And when I learned what it was, you know, what essentially tech startups were, I realized I had been doing that my whole life in some way or another since I was in the third grade, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know that it had a name and that it had a community and a tribe and a structure and all sorts of things. And I, had I known that, you know, with the magazine, I pro it probably would have done a lot better, like financially. Mm. It had a lot of soul to it. It had it, not soul like you know, this kind of soul. It had a lot of like <laughs> soul to it. You know, I like to crack myself up every once in a while. Um, <laughs> it had a lot to it that you can't manufacture and you can't replicate. So that, if I had no, like known the business side of things, it would have been unstoppable. So I I knew from personal experience um, just how hard it is to do something, to create something from nothing. And I was seeing a lot of other founders that were in the same boat. And I was like, oh, I, I want to talk to them because I want to start my own company. So I want to talk to people who are doing it. And the more I talked to people, the more I realized how difficult it was to get funding. And then on top of that, how much more difficult it was to get funding if you had any sort of um, other to you, any, you know, in, anything that wasn't um, already in the in the uh, the network, in Silicon yeah. Valley, and and that um, that sort of informed your whole investment thesis, right? Do you, yes. want, do you want to kind of talk about how you how your sort of set of beliefs and all those observations led to the the thesis you now have around investing? Yeah, I mean, it was it's, it was simple then, and it's simple now that there were and still are a ton of people who are simply being overlooked, and that can be for many reasons. Uh, I, I chose three that I was closest to, and I think by choosing these three, I also chose a fourth that I don't really say, but is implied, that is close to my heart. So women, just in general, uh, have a harder time raising money. It's like a fact when it comes to um, venture capital. People of color and LGBTQ, and I'm all three. And then there's this other layer to it that is just staring me in the face and I um, didn't think about it too much, but it is class. We talked about that last night. It's about um, you know, your, where you come from, social, economically. Uh, is that the word to say backwards? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I think a lot of people can relate to that no matter what their race or their gender or orientation is. So I was seeing that they were not getting, we were not getting a seat at the table. We couldn't even get a meeting to even explain what we were working on. And so as a person that this affected, it 
was frustrating and it was sad. It was disappointing. You know, it was sad for humanity and really sad for the people who were missing out. But then as the little third grader who loved Monopoly growing up and who had a candy store in the third grade and who had been, you know, hustling my whole life, I said, man, we just, we just stumbled upon like one of the best opportunities I can imagine for what this venture capital world says it is. Mm. And, and that's quite a different thesis to, to pretty much, at least three years ago, any VC mm -hmm. that existed, right? Definitely three years um, ago, yeah. There are more and more. It's started to change now. But mm -hmm. what, how, how did that, particularly with your background in music, the fact you hadn't been an investor before, the <laughs> fact you didn't have a background in startups, None the fact it. you had this crazy thesis that nobody else believed, how, what, what was the sort of implication of that when you went out to raise money? How did people react? Um, one of three ways. It was either just indifference, you know, you're, you're a nuisance, well, you're, you're nothing, you know, I don't, you don't even spark the radar. Or it was, uh, you're crazy, and I don't invest in crazy, uh, although they do, it turns out. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, or the third was uh, very condescending, you're, you have a good heart. <laughs> and, and someone actually said, bless your heart to me once, and this is Southern, you know. So, bless your heart. And I was like thinking like, no, write me a check. I'll bless my own heart. <laughs> um, and so it was, you, you're, you're, you know, this charity of yours is gonna do really well, just not with me, you know, like I wish you the best. I, if I hear the words, I wish you the best, one more time, that may be it. That may be the thing that cracks me, <laughs> because I, I, it's I don't want people to wish me the best, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, please do wish me the best. Don't wish otherwise, but you know what I mean. So it was that. It was it was those three things, and and maybe every once in a while someone would say, "It's a really interesting thesis, and it's really interesting. You're an interesting person to do that." Uh, you know, keep me posted on what you're doing. And those people who said that, who, you know, really did pay attention and who I would go back to and, and every six months or so would reconnect with, most of those people ended up being investors in the mm. fund over time. And, and that, your, your sort of list of LPs now includes all of the big names that, that sort of A everybody of knows of, yeah. you know, of Silicon Valley, Mark Andreessen and yeah. uh, Stuart Butterfield, etc. How did you kind of get your first yes after all the sort of no's and all the condescension and, and all of the sort of... Um, uh, well, it was f f a woman, you know, uh, women uh, are awesome, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a woman investor, and she was an angel investor who, um, it took about, let's see, it was May that I met her, and she invested in September, so it took the whole summer to convince her. I, she was a yes in May, actually. She was a yes in May, and um, we were like, arranging everything and I was so excited and I said okay so you're gonna wire the money and here's the wire information and I gave her the wire information you know this is I was homeless I don't know if some of you may not know that but I was homeless during this time so I sent her the wire information and it had my mom's name on it because the bank I didn't have a bank account and so I was telling this woman to send me a lot of money to a personal bank account that didn't belong to me and she was like, hmm, she's like, we should, we should back up a little bit and talk a little bit more about this. And I said, oh, okay, is there something wrong? Is there, did I, did I say something? And she's like, yeah, you have a personal account. It's not even in your name. I, don't, I just met you, how about? So she loved what I was saying. She really did. We, we talked for a long time about it, you know, for the, the first few days that we knew each other. She was really like, wow, this is interesting. And I, I have to give her that because she really, listened when a lot of people were not listening they weren't hearing me and she was seeing like even though she she couldn't predict what happened next because I couldn't she saw that there was something there and that maybe I was someone who could do it um, so then over the summer um, we just sort of kept in touch lightly like maybe every once every couple weeks and finally in uh, in August I said look I'm gonna go I'm meeting with this particular company this well-known company I'm gonna strike a deal with them and if I strike the deal, will you be in? And she said, yeah, let's set up a meeting for right after that meeting with them. We'll talk. So I went in. Um, I, I was 
at the same time, the, the person who was doing the deal said I was crazy to my face and said I would never accomplish what I wanted to accomplish, but also we'll give you a chance on this deal that we have. Not money, but this thing we're going to do. I took that, took it to Susan Kimberlin, and I told her I got it. You know, it wasn't easy. It was, you know, they put me through the ringer, but I got it. And she said, okay, give me, a, give me a couple more days. Let me think about it. I go away, and then next thing you know, she's letting me know she's in. And she wired the money to your mom's bank account? No, I, <laughs> no when, uh, when, she, when that happened and she told me about it, I was like, because again, you have to think like, I know it sounds crazy and almost dumb, but I really had nothing. And I was surviving in Silicon Valley with nothing on fumes. I wasn't eating most days. And my mom had a bank account. And sometimes, like, it's like my mom would just let me use her bank account because she's awesome. And so I said, I'm, I'm going to get this investment. How do I get it? And she said, well, you can use my account, and I'll get it to you, you know? So it sounds crazy, but it was just like us surviving. Um, but when that happened, and I, and I said, you know, why? And she told me why. I was like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let me give, me, give me a few minutes. And I walked from where we were meeting that in May. I walked to uh, a Wells Fargo and opened up a bank a business account and brought back the paperwork to her that same day. And um, so I had it, you know. It was too little too late, because it was like, you're still kind of weird, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, you know, you just kind of, I think everybody in this room knows what hacking is and, and just getting it done and maybe not knowing the rules, maybe not knowing what's the right way to do it, like what everybody else is doing, but you kind of figure it out, you look around and say, oh, they're holding their fork this way, okay, or they're using this certain fork for the salad, okay, I, I get it now. That's what I did, you know? Mm. So I figured out, okay, makes more sense to have a business account in my name. Check. <laughs> I will do that. And it came back with it, <laughs> you know? And so she saw those little things of um, me getting my act together. And to be quite honest, now I'm going to be honest and um, a little boastful, which I tend to do. Um, you're talking about, like, when it comes to that particular thing, the, the bank account or, you know, not having a, an office or all of these things. Those things can be taught and those things can be fixed. What I was suggesting to her three years ago, to this month, three years ago, was looking out into an open field and saying, imagine skyscrapers, imagine this has roads and infrastructure and there's an underground and all of this. I was saying that to her and so I didn't feel ashamed or embarrassed that I didn't know you're supposed to stand on this mark in order to, to tell that vision. Because how many people have that vision? You can point out a lot of people who know how to get a bank account, but how many people have the vision that I had? So I, I have to go back and kind of heal myself a little bit and give myself credit for some of those things that I was beating myself up about before. Mm. Cool, and I'm, I'm, after this last question, I'm going to move to questions from you guys. So um, uh, you should all have the Slido code. Uh, I think it's P139. Don't quote me on it. I think it's P139. Um, uh, but, but yeah, just, just as, a, as a last question to y'all, what, what was the sort of, I think when I think about your journey and having seen you from three years ago to now, the, the thing that uh, always strikes me is that you literally don't let anything get in your way. Um, and I think all of these people in this room right now are in the same kind of position where they need to not let anything get in their way to yeah. do what they need to do yeah. and, and want to do. Um, what was your sort of like, do you have any advice or sort of thoughts on, uh, on how you manage to kind of just keep moving forwards even though Ooh. everything is sort of stacked against you? Yeah, I have a lot of, a lot of thoughts on that. I, I, I think it's important, a couple of things, is to not let anything get in your way but keep, keep a humanity to you and a kindness to you throughout because you don't know what's going to happen on the side. You don't know if you, some of you will go on to just be wealthy beyond all measure. Some people will get cool jobs and that'll be good and some people will not uh, work, work out as much. But no matter what, y you, you have to live with yourself and the decisions that you make. So I would say that a lot of times um, we are faced with decisions that are temporary, that where, where temporary solutions seem like the right thing, but they come at a, co a high cost, but it'll make the temporary pain a little less. If you can get to a point where 
you're look you're constantly looking into the future and not letting that be your guide i think you'll go really far i also think when it comes to the kindness um, you're going to see people every which way you're going to see people on your way they say you see the same people on your way up is down that's a little sad but <laughs> um, you're going to see people everywhere there are so many people and this is like actually happening with gimlet with the recording of this podcast because they documented me for so long where i'm hearing from actually people from the past and i'm having to um who i you know i haven't talked to in years so i'm hearing talk about me i'm also having to pull up emails from 10 years ago 13 years ago seven years ago and you know something that i noticed is that i got you know obviously got a lot of rejection all day long about all kinds of stuff, not just the fun, but even before that, trying to get into music, all of that. When I would get a rejection, so I was pulling up all these diligence emails for Gimlet, and it, you have to take a screenshot and show, like, yes, this actually happened. I would, all these screenshots show me saying, um, thank you for the opportunity. Sorry that it didn't work out. Thank you for letting me. It was a lot of gratitude and a lot of, um, you don't have to be nice or polite. But like the intent of, I'm not going to just burn a bridge, this temporary bridge, because it didn't work out this one time, that is certainly coming back in a good way, you know, coming back around. So um, that's a little bit of advice I'll give you, is just think a little, look, think into the future with your decisions. And, and ultimately, to get there, what's helped me is, um, the purpose, the, the, the why. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? Why is it important to you? And it doesn't have to be like a social mission, but whatever it is, um, if, it, if, it, if you think about it as you're going to sleep and you wake up to thoughts about it and it, it fuels you and it brings you happiness, and again, I'll, I'm repeating this, but maybe you haven't heard it, if you feel that what you're working on today has to exist in five years with or without you, then you should keep doing it. If you think it belongs in the world with or without you being a part of it, then it belongs in the world. Amazing. Cool. Thank you very much. That's super interesting. Um, I'll just bring up... Slide. So um, I'll slide. Slide. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so I'll, I'll sort of ask you questions. Okay. Um, and get upvoting if you haven't already to, to, to see the ones that you want um, answered. You're so polite here. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> like that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been doing the weird uh, American version version of this accent uh, of an accent that I've created since I got here, and I apologize to you. <laughs> I apologize to everyone on the streets. <laughs> um, the, the first question is, what is the most impactful, non-obvious advice that somebody has given you? Mm, non-obvious, ooh. I don't know if it's going to be the most. Those most ones are hard on the spot. Um, I guess, You know, uh, I mean, this is kind of obvious, but I'll just say it because it comes to mind. I was worried about some. I was worried about something. I was like, like about a year and a half ago. I was worried about what, um, what someone was thinking about a decision I was making, and my friend, who is also someone we invested in later, just very quickly, she's like, "Are they writing you a check? Do they do they pay your rent, or did they give birth to you?" And I said, no, no, and we knew. <laughs> and they said, why does it matter what they think? Like, you know, and I, it was just like, oh, huh, yeah, you're right. Because, I mean, I'm not going to just, you know, not listen to people if they're saying I'm, I'm hurting them or I'm doing something that's hurtful. But someone just having an opinion of me is, like they say, it's none of my business. Your opinion of me is none of my business. And so that stuck with me for a long time. And that's, you can blame her for my uh, ego. Because <laughs> it stuck with me. <laughs> uh, the next one is, is, what do you think the rest of venture is getting wrong? And why do, you, why do they fail to see the potential of minority communities? Mm -hmm. uh, well, 
most venture capitalists still today are, are uh, I mean, there's, not, there's a few of them, you know, there's just hundreds of them. They're not, it's not a great population of, you know, quantity. So it, most of them are affluent white males in the U.S., the ones that I'm talking about, and some here that I've, you know, learned about. And for the most part, they just don't have the experience when I, because I, I made the point of saying affluent, because uh, I know that <laughs> there are a lot of white men who aren't silver, sil silver spoon, you know, havers or whatever. Um, but yeah, when you, when you think about um, their experience, a lot of them kind of rolled out of bed at Stanford, fell on the floor and stood up and said, oh, I want to be a VC. <laughs> That's how they talk. That's the, <laughs> I've, I've perfected it, the, the, the mannerisms. I want to be a VC, make a lot of money. That's it. <laughs> and um, there are some really thoughtful ones. I'm sure that the ones that are super thoughtful about their thesis uh, get tired of me saying that. But until the day that the majority aren't that, I'm going to say it because it's true. I do a, I do a, a, a survey, like a, my own sort of survey into the landscape every so often. And until the day I don't see that, uh, I, will, I, will I will talk about it. I think they're getting wrong, obviously from my lens, they're still lagging behind when it comes to diversity. I think they're, there's so many VCs who honestly, honest to goodness, think that I am a charity and think that the, honest to goodness, think that the people we invest in are charity and that we're, they're doing us a favor by letting me be in the building. And I, swear, I started saying like a month or two ago that Elon Musk could be my butler in a few years. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just think that people think that the way it's always been is how it's going to continue to be and it's just going to be like, you know, this is, I'm good. I got my I got my corner office. I make my good salary, and I know what my life looks like for the next ten years, twenty years. We're good. You're going to get disrupted. They're going to get disrupted, and it's already starting to happen. You have people like me who are doing things like oddly, you know, in VC. You also have a lot of people who are black and brown and women who are coming up in their own firms, you know. It's going to look different in a few years, and it's going to be people who, um, that backstage, my fund my, might have inspired, who are going to start doing things that compete with venture. Wouldn't you rather have these these minds working with you? Wouldn't you rather be making money with them rather than competing with them? Um, and what gets you most excited or interesting in, interested in a founding team or potential investment? Uh, well, excited. I like that term because we see so many companies now. I get excited if, if I get excited. You know, I get excited if something is like, oh, I haven't heard of that before, or I haven't seen it from that point of view before. Like, I like when people teach me something, and it doesn't have to be like this long presentation or. Um, polished or anything. It's just something where my, I go around all the time talking about bias and talking about privilege of other people. When my bias and my privilege is challenged, I find that to be really, really fascinating um, because I have both. And bias we all have. Privilege is new to me. Some of it I've mined on purpose, and some of it has been bestowed upon me because uh, my circumstances have now changed. When I can be challenged and like, something can be shown to me in a different light, uh, I get really excited by that. Cool. Um, and as sort of a, a follow-up question to that, what is one of your most exciting recent investments, and why did Ooh. you invest in them? Give me one second, because we've invested in, I'm trying to think both what we can announce and what was most recent. Um, <laughs> Too many to count. I know, I know, it's silly, but it, it's, okay. So, we just invested in 
Well, a, a company called Beautycon. Uh, they're out of Los Angeles. And um, actually, it's a rare case where I meet the company and invest just a few days later. Um, usually, it, it takes several months of diligence and figuring it out. But they were they struck me really fast. Uh, the woman int uh, interviewed me actually at, a, at an event, uh, Maj, and she is a queer woman of color who is running a company that has um, eight digit rev uh, annual revenue. And I had never heard of her. And um, that was kind of an easy, that was an easy one for me, just because, I mean, obviously they're doing well, but because she was someone who, uh, she was like my hoodie twin, like we're both wearing hoodies at this fancy event. She, I was pattern matching, you know, I was pattern matching for, for myself. And they have a really interesting um, company where they put on events in the beauty industry rather than focus only on product, which I think is cool. And I think it's like hugely, like I feel like even though they have all of this revenue right now, they're just scratched the surface of what they could be. And that's one of those things where the market is really, not only is it big, but it's, um, I'm, I'm excited by not knowing how big it could be. It seems very um, open field to me. Cool. Um, and beyond vision, what other characteristics are difficult for a founder to learn? Oh, um, well, EQ, you know, emotional quotient. Um, it, you're, it's hard to teach someone how to be kind and, and how to, to be, you can, you can teach someone how to be careful. You can teach someone how to be uh, discreet and tactful. I've learned because someone taught me. I don't do it all the time, but they taught, I've been taught it. And, but it's hard to teach someone how to, how to really treat other people really well. So that's something that you can tell really fast with someone when you're meeting with them. You can tell very fast. Um, and yeah, I think just the, I think, I mean, startups are hard. <laughs> like business is hard, like creating a business is hard because the reason it's the hardest, I think, is because once you've learned something, there's a whole nother group of things to learn immediately if it's going well. So definitely if it's not going well, you're learning every day and you're figuring it out. But even, once it starts going well, that's when the real work starts because you have to learn how, I know I'm learning right now about how to, like, how to lead a company that's growing and doubling in size every few months. That's, um, that's something that I don't think anyone could have taught me that. Mm. And I think, I think I'm doing an okay job at it, but it's, I'm making mistakes along the way, and I think that's the only way to learn that. Mm. Yeah, and I will mention another company uh, because I know that they just put out their um, they put out some inv invites to to start uh, to um, check them out. Flora Living, we invested in them in October, so it's not super recent relative to our other investments. But it's run by uh, three co-founders in LA, and one of them is the singer Kehlani. I don't know if she's popular out here yet, uh, but she's, uh, she's kind of amazing. She just opened for Demi Lovato on tour and uh, was up for American Music Award against Beyonce and Rihanna, and it was- the competition. Yeah, and she was up for that award, and she was working on her app, like while she was you know, up for that award. You know, I just thought that was so great, and she's she's a really fascinating young woman, and I, could, I get to say that now. I'm old enough to say young woman, <laughs> oh. but she is, and so check Flora Living uh, is the name of the app, and her name is Kehlani. Cool. Um, why did you come to London for this trip? Did you have an, <laughs> did you have an agenda? Who asked? <laughs> Is that, is that Anastasia who's with me? <laughs> Why are we? <laughs> um, well, yes, I had an agenda. Um, I wanted to, I was here in February and Andy uh, took me around and showed me a lot of, met, I met with a lot of different uh, founders and uh, investors. And I was just kind of checking out the landscape. You know, I've been asked to come here uh, get asked to come to a few cities, and like I always want to check out as much as I can. So we put together put together a really great tour, and then um, 
something, I was like, huh, I'm, I'm working on a project where I'm thinking about doing things in other cities. Uh, London could be one of them. Let me check it out again. And so um, I came here to meet with some more founders and some more investors to see what's up. <laughs> cool. Does that answer it? <laughs> Um, were there ever moments when you really struggled to show that kindness that you talked about because everything was so frustrating? Mm, yeah, I mean, I, if you follow me on Twitter, I cuss people out all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't think I ever, I don't think I could ever, I hope I never get to the point where I'm just steamrolling somebody just because I'm not having a good day. Um, but it, we're hum, all human. I've definitely... I'm sure I've been rude. I actually do also come across rude when I'm writing, like uh, like emails and Slack. Like I, I I was reading like like a like some stuff I was writing, and I was like, man, I sound so angry, but I'm just like chill. I'm just like you know, yeah. And, but it comes across. Uh, but no, in general, I feel very kind, and I try to be, and I think about it every day, very intentionally. So I hope that I don't hurt anyone. It's important to me on a daily basis that I uh, give more than I take from the world and that I don't, I do no harm in, in my, whatever, in my uh, escalation. You know what I mean? Like, in anything that I want to do, I want to lift while I climb. I'd rather not hurt others to get there. So hopefully, you know. But um, one caveat, Trump. <laughs> you know, that was, that's no it. No kindness for That's him. it. Yeah. Um, there's time for, for a couple more questions. Uh, first one, you, you mentioned class. Uh, in, the UK public, in, in the UK, the public school system gives people massive networking advantages. Mm -hmm. Any ideas how to level the playing field? Well, you know, to be honest, I'm, I'm just learning about it now. I'm learning about, I mean, I, obviously, I, it's, it's the same in the US, but... Um, I'm learning that there's a lot I need to learn about London and about the UK and about you know what you can't see on the surface with a couple of me with a couple of trips so uh, I, I would say that I would need to know more before I could answer that in a really thoughtful way cool um, and then the last one does your fund invest in founders outside the US yes we've invested in a company that's based in London um, called XO. It's a uh, fashion tech. And I met the one of the co-founders, um, it's a woman here. I met her uh, through a, a musician's tour manager that I used to work with. And it was a, um, you know, you got to meet this person just for fun. Met her, saw what she was doing. She also did an accelerator in the States. And they did well there. And so I had a little bit of diligence I could do on what they were working on because wasn't able to visit them before we made the decision um, or visit what they were, you know, working on. So yeah, we've done that. Um, it's not, it's not, we, it's not that we won't invest outside of the U.S. It's that the same way that I need to learn more about like class here. Uh, I've learned that a lot of people in London, when they think about startups, they just they. A lot of people think it's like this, what's on TV or in the movies in America. Like Silicon Valley is it. Like that is the word, right? There is so much that even people in America don't know about what's going on in the rest of the country in the U.S. And so it was important to me that I made sure that we went to Mississippi and then we went to Michigan, Detroit, Brooklyn, Philadelphia, uh, St. Louis looking for companies and really uh, trying to to work there and that we didn't just say okay San Francisco New York Boston and then the rest of the world so I kind of that's why we have 98 companies or nearly that uh, that are in the US and only a couple that are that are outside but part of the reason I'm here is because that could change soon. Amazing. So nice note to end on, leaving you guys <laughs> in suspense. Um, cool, Arlen. Thank you so so much for coming in. Um, I, I definitely you. learned a lot, and I hope you guys all um, all learn a lot. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>